Chapter 24 Lord Kelvin's Curse All forecasts are wrong. Some forecasts are more wrong than others. Anonymous Prediction is very difficult, especially if it involves the future. Niels Bohr It has been said that he who lives by the crystal ball soon learns to eat glass. Zoltan Mercezi 24.1 The Limits of Knowledge I often say that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the stage of science, whatever the matter may be. Lord Kelvin, Addresses, 1883 Previous chapters have discussed a number of attributes of systems, for example, the presence of slow and fast variables, life cycle, level of contingency, and within-system decision-making. Taken together or alone, these may assist in forming perspectives on planning and the system to which planning is applied. This subsection will not restate those system attributes and ask about the insights they offer. Rather, we attempt to respond to the often heard comment that these systems are social ones and analysis won't work. Suppose these were physical systems. How well could they be studied? How well could forecasts be made? Garrison was once a meteorologist. He still follows that literature in a casual way. What does the meteorology experience tell us? Meteorological or weather processes are completely understood in broad outline. Processes are those applicable to systems and given initial condition. Laws describe changes in states due to changing energy flux. Given that situation, there would seem to be two tasks. First, fill in gaps in the science and data. Recent work has clarified the relations between sunspots and weather. Second, improve the calculations required when large systems are analyzed. Larger computers allow us to solve those equations in a more precise way and in a shorter period of time. So there should be more precision in weather forecasting than previously. There's a parallel to work in the Urban Transportation Planning System, UTPS, the standard forecasting methods used in transportation. UTPS analysts take the processes to be well known, for example, traffic assignment. A lot of effort is going into numerical methods for solving equations and forecasting, and there's work to polish up empirical details. Returning to meteorology, large computers began to come along in the 1970s, and for a time there was a flurry of effort in numerical weather forecasting. But with experience, it was found that this forecasting was no better than forecasting using previous techniques. What seems to be the problem? After all, a meteorological system is a physical system. It obeys laws, so one ought to be able to predict states. To date, we've been able to make much progress on long-term weather forecasting. We know winter will, on average, be colder than summer, and we know it will rain in 10 minutes, but it will rain tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Should we cancel the game? Should we irrigate the crop? Those questions remain unanswered. Advances in models and remote sensing may help, but we are not there yet. There's a parallel between meteorological forecasting and the UTPS. We have some exact techniques for parts of the UTPS, but they are applied to systems where the initial state is far from known. There is another aspect of weather forecasting problem. There has long been the assumption that the system could be described with continuous well-behaved functions. Now researchers think that chaos and its mathematics are an inherent part of system behavior. There is some parallel to that in the UTPS. We find the weather forecasting perspective useful because it suggests a good bit. There are problems that would exist in the UTPS even without the complications induced by the social elements in urban and transportation systems. Do we know initial states? Do well-behaved functions describe the dynamics? We have observed that the steps toward the end of the UTPS process involve rather exact task statements and methods for doing calculations. We know exactly how to assign traffic to networks, make mode choice studies, do economic analysis, and undertake zone-to-zone -zone traffic distribution analysis. One may claim that exact calculations are also made in earlier steps, but on comparison, problem statements and calculations are rather fuzzy. One could suggest several reasons for this. The one we usually state is that the near the end of the process steps are more exposed to clients and general publics and thus beg precision. One could also suppose that the content of these steps is closer to the peer group interests of workers and or that the earlier steps treat inherently more difficult topics. All of this, of course, implies that we have precision without accuracy, which is not very useful at all. We refer to the precision called for by Lord Kelvin as Lord Kelvin's curse, for it yields a perspective that too often generates work with much attention to numbers and little attention to thinking. Even with its dangers, a small dose of analytic thinking and number crunching may offset planning steered by advocates and assertion.
24.2 Policy wants to control. Policy is a rule or set of rules for control. The term cybernetics, which is the study of feedback and automatic control, comes from the Greek word kubernetes, meaning pilot, or steering, or control. The word government comes from the same word, Latin's translation, gubernetes, hence the word gubernatorial. We have run across two physical models of how to control system or parts of systems that shape policy thinking. 24.2.1, the law of inertia. The system to be controlled is seen as moving along a development trajectory, and policy aims to accelerate or decelerate development or steer the trajectory if there had been a perturbation pushing the system off track. That's a control problem very similar to the man on the moon problem, and the Newtonian model applies from circa 1686 in Newton's Principia. We agree with the interpretation that policymakers and analysts tend to be Newtonian, but we have never tried to explain that to a policy analyst and would not dare to try. An object has attributes of velocity, b, position, r, and acceleration, a. We can move along its trajectory, r of t, in any direction we want to. A point on the trajectory is a state, and the objective of policy is to move from one state to another. That thinking underlies the way policy is discussed. The debates concern desired states and ways to move things. Time's arrow has no meaning. A dynamic object is controlled by initial conditions. So we accelerate transportation development by pumping money into it. The reader may react that ours is an outrageous and unneeded abstraction. We do not think it is. A large proportion of the policy work we have experienced involves thinking that the problem is to tweak in the direction things are going, steer within a narrow lane, or to accelerate by subsidies or decelerate by taxes. The change of structure and behavior in fundamental ways is not considered. 24.2.2, the second law of thermodynamics. We have also observed another way of thinking. It comes up in debates about transportation and energy and the inevitability of congestion. Carbon fuels are limited in supply, and they are being exhausted. A new facility is provided, and there is more travel, and we have an eliminated congestion. In these cases, the problem to be controlled is that of managing a bleak future. The future is bleak because technologies are inherently self-limiting. It's inevitable that things will get worse, and we must adjust expectations downward. Although we may be pushing the abstraction too far, perhaps the implicit model is an entropy one, dating from Clausius in 1850. In particular, the second law of thermodynamics influences thinking roughly any physical system left to itself distributes its energy in a manner so that entropy increases, the available energy of the system diminishes. Things run to homogeneity and death. The theory of Thomas Malthus on the inevitability of overpopulation and the work of William Stanley Jevons on the effect of sustained growth in English coal consumption represent the independent development of ideas that yield end states similar to those that entropy think yields. Jevons' 1866 book, The Coal Question, had wide influence. Jevons was highly regarded in academic circles and government policymakers paid much attention to his point that the growth of coal production driven by industrialization would soon exhaust English supplies. His broader point was that technologies are inherently self-limiting. His was a theory of technology that continues to hold coin for many. He posed the policy issue, we have to make the choice between brief greatness and longer continued mediocrity. The figure is adapted from Jevons' book and more recent data, presented here because of its similarity to population, and energy, see the next figure, land use, and other projections we have seen. The magnitude of the forecasting error is huge. Observe the log scale on the y-axis. Similarly, as can be seen in oil price forecasts, even when conducted by experts in the field, they tend to be extrapolations of recent trends. Every court forecast from Delphi 1 to Delphi 9 expected prices to rise in the long term, despite 20 years of largely falling prices. This is not to say prices won't rise, just that the forecasts have been consistently pessimistic. If we knew with certainty the price of gasoline a year from now, we would be rich. How is this pattern of thinking reflected in policy? We hear debates about how we are running out of petroleum, energy available for the system is diminishing. It is assumed the highway system is fully deployed, things run to homogeneity and run out of steam. The only thing that can be done is to control boundary conditions, for that is the way thermodynamic objects can be controlled, and except mediocrity. So we control energy use in automobiles by seeking improved use of propulsion energy and accept the mediocre service of congested transportation facilities. 24.2.3. We can think better. We do not dispute scarcity and limits. For example, we talk about peak travel in section 24.6.2, but we don't want to forget about innovation as a mechanism for addressing it. This discussion is not saying that policy analysts should ignore resource matters, for certainly resource questions drive important parts of policy agendas. 
we are discussing self-limitations and inevitability. Again, the reader may think our abstraction is outrageous and unneeded. The authors return that thought around and say, it is outrageous that we think about policy and forecast processes in physical system terms. We do indeed do that, even though transportation systems are socio-technological systems. The broad point of this discussion of control is that people accept things as they are and limit the consideration of policy instruments to those that can shift states and or change boundary conditions. Movement is along an equilibrium path. Those ways of thinking are not wrong, they are just too limited. We can think much better. Twenty four point three forecasting travel. Traffic forecasting has tended to apply Newtonian thinking to the problems of traffic. While methods of extrapolation have become more sophisticated, moving from forecasting traffic on roads directly, a method still used in rural areas and by pavement analysts, to forecasting traffic between origins and destinations, to forecasting the behavior of individual travelers, in the end we are dealing with a paradigm of extrapolation. 24.3.1 UTPS emerges. It is useful to describe the modern urban transportation planning system, or model, UTPS, as a clean break from precursor urban transportation planning experiences, although some exceptions will be noted. As a clean break, the emergence of modern UTPS ignored the well-honed planning techniques for arterial roads and local streets lodged in urban public works offices, and transit experiences in the beginnings of transportation and land use planning in the style of Nelson Lewis lodged in emerging planning agencies. The UTPS also ignored some urban traffic analysis experiences to be discussed shortly. In this ignoring, more than one kit bag of techniques replacing another was involved, for there were institutional and conceptual breaks. There was a break, and we can think about it that in two ways. Modern UTPS can be viewed as revolutionary compared to precursor planning, following the body of literature on how revolutions in analysis, science, occur. People who have discarded old dogmas develop new, more powerful ideas. The new drives out the old over a generation as the bearers of old ways retire and the new move up the ladder. In the UTPS case, the rearrangements during World War II may have aided the displacement of the old by the new. The establishment doesn't change its collective mind. Rather, young researchers who create and join new schools form a new establishment. There is evidence for this process in common experiences as well as in the sciences. On the other hand, there is evidence, especially in the transportation experience, that the new is built from the old. The new is built by putting existing building blocks into new designs that work about two times better than the old. Adoption is pushed by this more effective construct. That's the way, for example, modern container shipping was developed. It put hard and soft building blocks together in a new way. Actually, a close examination of change reveals that both behaviors are usually found. For example, contemporaneously with the emergence of UTPS, a truck company manager, Malcolm McLean, who put liner company dogma aside as well as assembling building blocks from the transportation experience, developed container shipping. See chapter 19. The actors involved in UTPS development had not been involved in pre-World War II urban planning endeavors, and they did not have the burden of existing dogma defined by those endeavors. They weren't empty-headed, of course. They brought ideas to planning, and they borrowed ways of thinking about the UTPS problem. The realization of modern UTPS is often explained by saying that an analytic process pushed a weaker, less efficacious process aside. We do not find that explanation convincing. The analytic revolution was underway in social science and engineering, and we conjecture that no matter the origins of modern UTPS, an analytic process would have been developed. Indeed, as we will see when we examine work by urban transportation planners of the old school, they strive to work in an analytic fashion, and sometimes to be more analytic than UTPS innovators. We also may point out that the break was not just analytic versus non-analytic, for breaks in concepts and institutions were involved. The technical, institutional, and conceptual frames for what is called urban transportation planning, but is really simply urban transportation forecasting, emerged in the Chicago Area Transportation Study, CATS, which was initiated in the 1950s. The CATS approach, which was adopted nationwide and later worldwide, has evolved over time. Techniques have been refined and often they have been renamed. Indeed, techniques have been so modified that many practitioners are unaware of their origins. The CATS approach has been modified to accommodate scales and circumstances that differ to situation, mode to mode, and time to time. Creighton, 1970, is an example of a textbook using the pure CATS approach. 24.3.2, CATS is forecasting paradigm. With the upswing in urban growth following World War II, a number of cities began to engage in a new round of facilities planning. Even prior to World War II, the State Department of Highways in California had begun to construct freeway-like facilities in Los Angeles 
and planning for a more extensive system was begun in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The Detroit Metropolitan Area Transportation Study developed an extensive freeway plan. Minneapolis-St. Paul did some preliminary work, as was the case in the greater New York City area. Many of the actors who worked on the DMATS, the Detroit study, moved to Chicago when the Chicago Area Transportation Study work was initiated by the Illinois Department of Transportation in cooperation with the Bureau of Public Roads, including the director, Douglas Carroll. Katz's undertaking had the advantage that actors had already gone along the learning curve. Resources were sized to the tasks, and it was the right style of study at the right time when the interstate program was initiated. With respect to facilities, the Katz planning effort was a broad one. Attention was paid to the entire street network as well as to transit, and over the years there was attention to freight and air transport topics. This breadth was in spite of the state BPR sponsorship and their limited responsibility for urban facilities. Katz investigated a wide breadth of research topics as a review of Katz reports will reveal. In 1956, when the Interstate Act was passed, Katz was in place and engaged in a widely scoped study in the BPR style. Although broad, it did not extend to institutional and financing matters. Also, it did not interact with existing urban institutions. Public works agencies, city planning departments, the Metropolitan Planning Department, and public interest organizations, such as the Metropolitan Planning and Housing Council of Chicago. Federal legislation in the 1955 General Location Document gave the centerline mileage of the urban interstates. The technical questions about the urban extensions were their final locations, including interchanges and how many lanes to provide. To answer these questions, seven analysis steps were adapted by CATS. Economic and demographic forecasting, land use forecasting, trip generation forecasting, trip distribution forecasting, mode choice forecasting, route assignment, and economic evaluation. To answer questions about concepts adopted, one must first refer to the CATS planning scheme. See the figure. Careful attention was given to the unfolding of the physical feature of the future city and of travel demand, 2x in year 1, y in year 2, and so on. The analysis involved in putting the traffic on the network and determining needs for lanes. The plan was to be a one-time thing based on a one-time analysis. A 20-year time horizon was taken. The technology was given, freeways, vehicles, etc., as was policy, agency responsibilities, funding source, revenue source, new toll roads were a non-option, fixed lane mileage, etc., and the determinants of behavior, trip rates, willingness to travel, and preferences. It is important to see this planning scheme in a larger frame. It suggests how the planner forecaster apparently imagined that the worlds of policy, technology, and institutions worked. There is no feedback from the plan to policy or technology. It also suggests how planners and forecasters were thinking of urban growth and development and its relation to transportation. There is no feedback from the implementation of the plan to forecast. It was imagined that the plan, a map based only on the study of facts, was a one-time project rather than an ongoing process. It was accepted that an outside institution would draft the plan. Finance and control of facility development resided with the state and federal governments, largely external to the city. The plan aimed to satisfy demand rather than manage it, or balance supply and demand at an optimal level. It was given that the freeway was the technological solution and the problem was the journey to work. Other travel purposes and freight were ignored. Across town in Chicago, a completely different analytic framework was being developed by Beckman, McGuire, and Winston. However, these two approaches to modeling developed independently, and the Beckman path remained academic. In part, this is because Katz was uninterested in congestion pricing, which was the main point of the Beckman research. The divergence was also due to the practical matter that, at the time, equilibrium flows could not be handled within the planning models. The not-invented-here syndrome and different conceptual bases also delayed interest on the part of agencies in the use of linear and dynamic programming. Rather than building on the urban experience, Katz built mainly on the Bureau of Public Roads and State Highway Department experience. CATS was sponsored by the Illinois Department of Highways, and it is easy to see why many of the UTPS building blocks were from the state BPR experience. See section 15.8. And similarly, why building blocks from the urban experience were not used. 24.3.3 Evaluation Paradigm The theoretical roots of transportation evaluation are in microeconomic theory and in engineering economics. The consumer surplus idea, dating from the 1850s and developed by civil engineer Jules Dupuy, is on center stage. There are applied routes in railroad work as well, see Wellington, and in the analysis undertaken by the Bureau of Reclamation in the 1930s and 1940s especially. Martin Beckman and later William Vickery and many others applied Alfred Marshall's comfortable and well-known notion of consumer surplus, following Jules Dupuy. The figure provides a vehicle for the discussion of types of surpluses. Consumer surplus is the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay for some quantity of a product, as defined by the demand curve, 
and what he has to pay is defined by the price that must be paid for that amount. Producer surplus is the excess of total revenue over total avoidable cost that accrues to the seller as economic profit. At market price P0 and producer cost C0, resulting in level of consumption Q0, areas A and B represent consumer and producer surplus for an as-is situation. Areas G, H, J, and K show increases in surplus with lowered costs, the supply curve moves outward to S1, costs drop to C1 and prices to P1, leading to an increase in consumption at level Q1. Areas G and H show costs avoided or resources saved over the as-is situation. J is consumer surplus on new traffic and K is producer surplus on new traffic. Railroad and water project analyses developed in honed benefit cost and similar techniques. With this technique, a transportation system or facility can and should be thought about in the same way one treats widget production. It's one activity in a world full of atomistic activities. There's nothing special about it. The efficient manager takes stock of the costs of inputs, examines marginal costs, and selects the optimal output. If the values of that output are to be measured, they are in the calculi of benefit cost and consumer surplus. The 1956 interstate legislation called for the analysis of cost allocation and referred to user and non-user benefits. The legislation set off a good bit of empirical work and debate about benefits. In response, the widget production, microeconomic view, was revisited and written in terms explicit to transportation. The products of at least 10 or so authors might be noted, including Mooring, Horowitz, Meyer, Kane, Wall, Kuhn, and others. But incidence usually is ignored by the broad generalization that society is better off. So we have a conceptual scheme that lets us answer benefit questions, say, what will be the result of intelligent transportation systems, improvements in traffic flow? ITS will create surpluses of various kinds. This is how the benefits of investment are most widely thought about. Decreases in user costs are entered as benefits and benefit cost calculations. In addition to stress on benefits and benefit cost analysis, attention extends to optimal pricing policy. Vickery applied these notions to urban highway congestion and others addressed other modes. One result of this work was the deregulation of several of the modes to encourage their bringing prices charged in line with costs. There has also been an expansion of interest in congestion pricing on urban freeways and at congested airports. Time of day variation in transit fares has also resulted. Although this conventional view can claim considerable adoption, we continue to see debate that ignores it. Not too long ago, for example, an issue of Metro questioned why voters in Houston turned down taxes for the construction of a rail transit system even though the system would have 87,000 direct and indirect employees. Such employees should be counted on the cost side of the benefit-cost equation, of course, from a microeconomic perspective. It should be noted that many macroeconomists consider additional employment a benefit, so long as the economy is not at full employment. We also see some petty things one might quarrel about, things having to do with the assumptions and limitations of microeconomic theory. Distribution of costs and benefits ignored, increasing costs assumed, a complete market assumed, and so on. Such challenges are easily deflected. For instance, side payments can be developed to even out equity, the distribution of costs and benefits. At a larger scope, one may question how the paradigm catches the large impacts of transportation, bringing new resources into the economy, increasing the size of labor sheds, offering greater choices for jobs, shopping, recreation, and socialization, increasing market areas, and so on. The conventional wisdom answer to those questions is that these impacts are measured in the flow of consumer surplus. They are the basis of the elasticity of demand. 24.3.4, Diffusion of Cats. In 1956, the states were ready to build many rural interstate links and were thinking about the urban extensions. Cats was ready to be emulated, and it was. Emulators took from cats what they needed. The institution was copied, as was the size of the effort. But all this took time. Studies were initiated here and there as states could get organized. Some studies involved cooperation with local agencies, especially metropolitan agencies, where they were available. Even so, the local agencies were hardly full partners in the activity, for the Bureau and the states had control of funding and personnel. Many leaders in CATS moved to positions of responsibility in the newly initiated studies. Some of the studies relied heavily on cons consultants, and previous CATS actors turned up in that context. The Bureau pushed urban planning in the same way state planning had been pushed, and the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1962 required long-range comprehensive planning in the cities of 50,000 or over in population as a condition for the receipt of federal funds. The Bureau began to offer technical assistance and these steps greatly increased the transfer of CATS concepts and techniques. By the 1970s, freeway-type facilities were being planned in cities worldwide, 
and there was more and more emulation. By this time, of course, Katz's experience had been modified by experiences in other cities. It needs to be noted that institutional and size freeways aspects of the planning endeavors were modified as time passed. The Federal Aid Act of 1970 required that planning integrate highways into other transportation plans and the evaluation of social, economic, and environmental impacts of highways. The Act of 1973 opened highway trust funds to use by mass transit. It emphasized highway safety and completion of the interstate. Twenty-four point five traveler behaviors. UTPS attempted to forecast traveler behavior, but it missed several major aspects that structure travel. First, it was unstructured concerning how time is used for activities by travelers, and missed the notion of diminishing returns to travel, if not outright travel time budgets that constrain how bad congestion can get. Second, it did not consider systematically how those activities occur across the day. Twenty-four point five point one time use. The figure summarizes some long-term trends in time use in the United States. Despite differences in methods, some clear trends emerge. In 1990, adult Americans are working more on weekdays and less on Saturday than in 1954, although we the weekday rise is principally due to the larger number of women working outside the home. Shore, 1993, has argued controversially that time at work has risen for men as well. This may not show up in a travel or activity survey, but rather in wage data. The Saturday drop reflects the widespread adoption of the five-day work week since 1954. The amount of time spent shopping is held remarkably steady, although even small time differences in this category represent large percentage differences. Americans would appear to be shopping more on weekends. This is in part due to Sunday shopping, which was rare in 1954 due to so-called blue laws, but this also seems to be true on Saturdays. The two most curious categories are home and other. Given the increase in female labor force participation, time spent at home from 1954 to 1990 should be expected to decrease on weekdays. This is supported by the data. However, several interacting factors make the issue more complicated. Saturday work has decreased, which makes more time available on Saturdays for home and shop, while the opening of stores and other activity locations on Sunday enables people to get out on Sunday. The figure suggests the amount of time and travel is almost identical between 1954 and 1990. It raises the intriguing possibility that there is some form of travel time budget. There are 24 hours or 1,440 minutes in a day. Thus, per day, there is a fixed amount of time to do things. Consider a typical childless adult. Taking 8 hours for work, production, and another 8 hours for sleep, Marx's reproduction, reduces flexibility. Another proportion of that time must be spent on consumption, shopping, and eating. There are further household maintenance activities that must take place, cleaning, hygiene, medical care, and so on. Thus, there may be four discretionary hours per day. If that is the case, there is a practical upper limit on the amount of daily travel one can undertake, four hours, that is split between travel to work and travel to non-work activities and other discretionary activities. A lot of evidence supports that individuals spend a fixed amount of time per day, just over one hour, in transportation. See the next section. Yet, aside from the fixed bounds of the problem, the theoretical causal mechanism for a fixed budget is weak. Marchetti suggests that humans have a nesting and a roaming instinct. At night we return home, by day we stake out a territory for a fixed time. When people walk, the distance was short, but as technology has allowed us to move faster, horses, streetcars, automobiles, airplanes, we stake out a larger area. Other researchers disagree with the notion of a travel time budget, echoing Becker, who argued that trade-offs are made between travel time, other time, and expenditures for the full gamut of activities depending on relative price and income changes in the valuation of time. Levinson and Kumar note the stability in journey to work times over a long period in metropolitan Washington, D.C. The 1968 to 1988 data shown here, as well as similar numbers from 1958 by William White. Rational locators act to shift jobs to homes to maintain commute times. Thus, for instance, suburbanization of jobs helps solve the problem of long duration commutes by bringing work nearer to labor. Further, while congestion is rising almost everywhere, roads in suburban areas are still generally faster than roads in urban areas. As a greater share of travelers use the faster roads, the average overall average speed rises. That hypothesis provides a mechanism for stability in commute times, despite both rising congestion and longer commute distances. The stability in commute times might be consistent with Marchetti's notions, since it is the longest trip that stakes out territory. The shorter trips typically operate within those bounds. However, some data from other cities, for instance the Twin Cities, show that commute times are increasing over time. Can that be reconciled with the commute budget notion? We recognize that larger cities do have longer duration commutes than smaller cities, if only because there are more opportunities, jobs, 
farther away that have some probability of being taken. Further, the equilibration process noted in the rational locator hypothesis, the movement of jobs and homes, also requires time. There is a budget, which is on average at least as large as the commute times in the city, with the longest commute times. Then, residents of smaller cities may not have consumed their travel budget yet, and travel could be expected to rise. Mokhtarian and Shen suggest that the aggregate data mask individual variations, and although individuals may have personal budgets, those budgets are not necessarily the same. As different mixes of people comprise the population, the aggregate may shift, but if similar people occupy similar shares of the population, on average, the aggregate number won't move. The most important information for travel behavior analysis, the amount of time spent traveling, is ironically the least clear. There are, needless to say, many ways to cut the data. 24.5.2 Profile, Yakov Zahavi. Yakov Zahavi, 1926-1983, developed the UMOT, Unified Mechanism of Travel, in an effort to deal with supply and causal model issues. His first work was with aggregate data. Before his death, he began working on micro underpinnings. With respect to causal argument, Zahavi notes that the travel money budget runs about 12.5% of household expenditures for households that own cars, and runs about 4% for households without cars. He also observes time budgets. His analysis brings these demand measures to the supply of travel facilities to yield travel information. The data Zahavi musters have a things-are-the-same-everywhere character. Time and money expenditures are similar across nations, implying participation levels or market clearing in the same way everywhere. Household aspirations and capabilities tend to be similar, as are opportunities. Zahavi observes that the travel time budget ranges from 0.8 to 1.1 hours, and the TT over HH, travel time per household, is a function of household size and cars per household. As mentioned, the travel money budget, TM, varies between car-owning and non-car-owning households. Zahavi extensively uses data from cities in Europe, Asia, North and South America, and the Soviet Union. What did Zahavi accomplish? Zahavi starts with household income and size in the notion of a travel time budget. He examines the attributes of the supply of facilities. From these considerations, he calculates travel quantity measured in time, distance per traveler, and velocity dimensions. Time varies little. It is the daily travel distance that is the main variable explained. His argument is very convincing from an empirical among cities and households view. It gives satisfaction also because it is based on a utility maximization scheme. As stated earlier, Zahavi had begun working on within-city relations, and first within-city empirical results are convincing. Put another way, households may be thought of as being in one state or another, with auto or without. The decision to shift from without to with is based on distance and not time considerations. More money is spent if the household has an auto, so money is traded for distance. What does the household gain from distance? That's the question. Its answer must have to do with access to more options for housing, work, shopping, and so on, and or opportunities to specialize. 24.5.3 Temporal and Spatial Agglomeration The UTPS says nothing about time of day. Models have subsequently added simple models to allocate travelers to time of day, or complex models to predict individual activity patterns. This matters because facilities are seldom above capacity for an entire day, only for peak times. We typically observe peaks in travel demand on weekday mornings and evenings, as well as other times on select facilities. Friday late afternoons leaving town, Saturday afternoon on shopping streets. The figure illustrates this information. From 1968 to 1988, there were a spreading of the peak in Washington, D.C., as roads became more crowded, people were willing to start work earlier or later. But why does travel peak at all? A commuter could save travel time by leaving for work at 10 a.m. or 4 a.m., for instance. The first answer is that workers show up when their firms want them to. So why do firms want all their, of their employees at work at the same time? The reason that firms have for setting a regular schedule both internal for their employees and external in common with other firms is an economy of temporal agglomeration. A firm needs to coordinate activities internally, and to deal with customers and suppliers at the time when both are open. This is all made easier if everyone is at work during approximately the same time frame. This doesn't apply to every organization. Bars, which coordinate schedules to serve customers after work, may have later hours. Police, who need to arrest rowdy bar patrons, among others, must be on the job 24 hours a day. This economy of temporal agglomeration has benefits that outweigh the congestion costs they impose. Programs to introduce flex time and variable work schedules have had some effect, but not yet enough to flatten out the curve at a regional level. Yet the congestion effects are not small, and in the absence of road pricing are not fully considered by the travelers who create them. The congestion externality drives capacity investment. Without peaking, major roadways wouldn't need to be as wide. Capacity would be more evenly utilized throughout the day. 
pricing roads higher during the peak hours and lower during the off-peak, would provide incentives for travelers to consider whether peak period travel was necessary. Another point to note from the figure is that non-work travel also peaks during the afternoon, only slightly after work travel. Many of the travelers at a given time are non-work oriented. These trip makers presumably have, in general, somewhat less time pressures than those making work trips. Pricing may provide sufficient incentive for trips with a high elasticity of demand, or sensitivity to price, to move to an alternate time, smoothing out the peak and reducing the need for new construction. In a sense, peaks in time, rush hour, are like peaks in space, downtown. Both exist to obtain economies of agglomeration, the ability to do business with others because they are nearby and open. Both produce costs and make it more expensive for others to do business, but hopefully the gains from specialization and interaction outweigh the losses. Peak spreading is the temporal equivalent of suburbanization, without putting the same demands on creating new infrastructure. 24.6 Futures It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Upton Sinclair, 1935 24.6.1 Forecasting the Future of Forecasting After decades of stagnation, urban transportation models are changing in the early 21st century. There is a move in practice from a trip-based paradigm to an activity-based paradigm, moving toward a full agent-based model, including dynamic traffic assignment. From a modeling perspective, this is better as it allows better intrapersonal and intra-household substitutions and better accounts for underlying behaviors. The needs for models have moved from determining the number of lanes to determining results in pollution levels for air quality conformity analysis. To do that, models need to track which vehicle is used on which road by whom for how long. It is computationally more intensive and significantly more complex to program, but if done correctly, should be no worse at forecasting and probably better than a conventional aggregate technique. Models are not going away, but they are not getting better at capturing behavioral changes. They are still constructed assuming human behaviors are fixed. A 1960s person dropped into a 2010 model will behave the same as a 2010 person given the same set of demographic and socioeconomic inputs. The underlying preferences are fixed over time. The underlying technologies are fixed. Moving from forecasting to scenario testing, that is, from what will be to what if, would be a useful change in perspective. Nevertheless, legal requirements dictate the use of these models as long-term forecasting tools despite inherent inadequacies. 24.6.2 Forecasting the Future of Behavior Peak Travel One of the predictions of travel time budgets in the rational locator theory is that individual travel will not inexorably increase, but instead will only increase so long as the benefits outweigh the costs. One anticipates this process as diminishing returns. Ever-increasing travel cost will result in ever-decreasing additional benefits from travel. Passing a third supermarket is only marginally better than the second, and the fourth even less better than the first three. There are diminishing returns to opportunities. People will, given their location, trade off between those benefits and costs, and over the long term relocate to a place that gives them the options they prefer. Travel is correlated with the monetary cost of travel. So, if the price of fuel goes up, the amount of travel goes down. Travel is correlated with system utilization, so if the amount of congestion rises, willingness to travel diminishes, keeping supply and demand in an equilibrium. Travel is correlated with available network capacity. If the network is not growing, the rate of travel increase will be limited. Travel is correlated with population growth. If that slows, the growth in travel should slow. Travel is associated with wealth. If people feel poorer, they will consume less. Travel is correlated with life cycle. So, as fewer workers and parents with children are part of the system, we expect slightly fewer trips. Travel is associated with the need for travel. If some activities, working, shopping, playing, can be done online instead of in person, we expect less travel. In the United States and other advanced countries, travel per person, and perhaps overall as shown in the figure, appears to have peaked in the late 90s or early 2000s. Other resource consumption has also peaked. People have discussed peak materialization. The tons of material consumed has declined. Peak oil. Oil production may have peaked. And peak coal. The U.S. is burning less now than a decade ago, and CO2 emissions are falling. Per capita CO2 emissions in the United States returned to 1966 levels as of 2008. And total emissions are also down since 2008. The U.S. Energy Information Administration reports total U.S. carbon emissions have fallen from a 2007 peak of 6 billion metric tons to a 2012 estimate of 5.2 billion, near 1990 levels as petroleum and coal have declined and natural gas has risen, and so on. The logic of this follows the life cycle model we have used throughout the book. As a system matures, we expect its curve to flatten, and we expect it to decline as substitutes for the service the system provides are found. 
Oil production may peak either because we are in fact close to running out, or because alternatives, such as newly inexpensive natural gas, act as a substitute, or both. The search for substitutes is not unrelated to the anticipation of either decreasing oil or increasing costs of oil extraction. The difficulty in forecasting is anticipating the peak before it occurs. While most people get the existence of the peak, not all do, as Upton Sinclair put it, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on upon his not understanding it. The harder part is establishing the timing and magnitude of the peak. Is the current downtrend just a temporary change or permanent? The difficulty in politics is telling people that something has been regularly growing for 70 years, like automobile travel, has peaked. 24.6.3 Telecommunications and Transportation, Complements or Substitutes Molkier, 2004, describes the Industrial Revolution as first involving innovations in the factory system in the late 18th century, followed by transportation innovations in the first half of the 19th century, with telecommunications, telegraph and then telephone, in the second half of the 19th century. The peak of the factory system, in a sense, is when factories and transportation enabled and required agglomeration, and before telecommunications enabled more remote, real-time action. The gains in transportation implied that the relative costs of moving people initially declined faster than the costs of moving information. Expertise was more likely to be supplied in-house rather than using hired consultants when production was very specific and local. Knowledge pooling, for instance a hospital with many specialist doctors rather than individual general practitioners, arose in many professions law, engineering, medicine, architecture, teaching. This was another economy of scale of centralization enabled by transportation. Kuglelis, 2004, argues that new technology increases time fragmentation, so activities are increasingly interspersed, what some call multitasking. The argument about transportation and communication as substitutes or complements has yet to be resolved. However, more evidence is suggesting substitutability, as younger generations travel less and delay the purchase of a vehicle and spend more time online. Work at home can be compared with a factory, work out of home systems, basically as trade-offs in scale economy and transport costs. To the extent that scale economies are less achieved with people commuting out of the house because manufacturing requires less and less labor, shopping can be more effectively conducted virtually rather than in-store, and telecommunications become better and better substitutes for in-person contact, we should expect substitution to become the more dominant feature of the relationship between transportation and communication. Mobile phones, though, are obvious complements to transportation, and mobility is becoming an increasing significant component of the information technology landscape. As of this writing, Apple Computer, the most valuable company in the world, earns most of its profits from mobile devices, having surpassed transportation energy supplier ExxonMobil in market value in 2011. 24.7 Discussion from UTPS to Inquiring Design we have stressed the notion that present-day planning concepts and techniques result from interacting precursor experiences with the problems at hand. An interesting aspect of modern UTPS is the way it drew on the rural road, Bureau of Public Roads, and state experiences rather than urban experiences. We have also stressed the role of CATS. It was there to be emulated when the need for urban interstate planning emerged. That emulation was selective. CATS was broad-based undertaking. Emulators took what they needed. It is important to understand the task posed by urban interstate planning. Interstate designs were rural designs. The interstate involved space-consuming, limited-access designs. These designs were imposed in urban areas. Center line mileage was limited, so the central question became, how many lanes? Why limited access? Land development and accompanying turning traffic had unwanted impacts on state highways, and the Bureau wanted to avoid that. Also, abutting structures and curb cuts had made it difficult to add capacity when needed. The Bureau's rural experience had been to make plans and implement. 20 years was the expected life of pavements, so they made 20-year plans. At the end of 20 years, more planning and implementation would be undertaken. The new pavements, add more lanes, straighten curves, new bridges, and so on. That sort of thinking was taken into the urban area where it was inappropriate. Essentially, the interstate built out so far as the capacity of areas allowed. Previous remarks have said that the UTPS was a product of its positioning within the environment. The general environment said, do it on the cheap, and the transportation environment said, do it this way at this stage in the life cycle. In a sense, UTPS was what had to be, and we can understand it completely. If we were to do it again, or if another situation comes along in which something similar is called for, it would seem improvements would have to be addressed to the working of the system logic rather than to UTPS logic. So, we leave the UTPS for the moment and jump to the model we have in mind for large system planning or planning working on the system logic. 
rather than tackle the impossibility of forecasting and running into Lord Kelvin's curse. In our ideal, one operative word for planning would be inquiring, another would be design. We would like analysis that scope from all building blocks, knowledge, available technologies, physical facilities, institutions, etc., and that produce designs. We imagine such designs having physical content and extending to institutional, policy, and other soft matters bearing on the workings of a design. The design should be consistent with deep-running social and economic trends and constraints of all sorts. They should open options, development pathways, rather than mine out options. They should offer choices to the public. It's by offering choices about pathways that planning is inquiring. Let's be clear about what we are saying. In previous discussions, we presented the system logic. It has a disjoint character. And the microprocesses at work yield a macro realization of an S-shaped sort. There is no reason to think of that realization as having optimal properties, but there is reason to think that it's very stable. We are saying UTPS-like activities are an outcome of system properties, and the way to improve UTPS-like activities is to develop a scope and style of planning that changes system properties rather than simply forecasting within the constraints of existing system properties subject to the limits of cognition and self-serving assertion.